I want to challenge you to just spirit, soul, and body lean out toward heaven and do your best to give the Holy Spirit and God's word your undivided attention. It's amazing. One thing the Holy Spirit whispers to you from the scripture, from a message, can really change your whole life or set you up or set you up for a season of blessing that you can't comprehend. And sometimes it, it's just the, the smallest thought that comes, and it might come at the beginning, might come in the middle, it might come in the end. But we need to give God our, our attention. So let's just, uh, just do that. Father, you've got us right now. We give your word first place. We will keep it before our eyes. We'll listen to it with our ears. We will incline our heart because we know it's life and health to all those that find it. Holy Spirit, thank you for working tonight. And Lord, my prayer is just that as people have put the kingdom first and come into your house tonight when there's so many other things going on, that you would take care of their houses. You would take care of the issues and the concerns of their life. We just trust you to work out there while we are with you in here. Work in people's finances, I pray. Work in their family situations. Work out areas of conflict on the job. Whatever it might be, Lord, just pray that you work in your people's behalf. To the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Please open your Bible to Exodus chapter 15. We're going to be looking at some of the prayers of Moses tonight. Now, Moses had a lot of conversations with God and actually prayed a lot of prayers both before he returned to Egypt and while he was in Egypt, mostly connected with the deliverance of God's people out of bondage. But what we want to do tonight, we're going to look at some of the prayers that Moses prayed after they crossed the Red Sea and began traveling through the wilderness. Exodus 15 and verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, when they had come to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. One of God's compound names, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, your physician, the Lord, your healer. Now, they come in the wilderness, there's no water, the people begin to complain, and Moses prays a very concise, short, hot prayer. We're not told what it was, just as he cried out. It's probably something like, help! <laughs> and God answered him in a miraculous way. Showed him a tree. He threw the tree into the bitter waters and they turned sweet. And it's worth noting that here God reveals himself as Israel's healer before he even gives them the Ten Commandments or any of the law. Almost like a mother tends to the physical well-being of her child before she sees to the child's education. And I believe that God wants the newest babe in Christ to be introduced to him as healer. It's one of the top things on God's agenda. And friend, this happened before the law. It doesn't pass away with the law. God is a healer by nature, and what he is by nature is not dispensational. You don't relegate it to Old, or te Old Testament or New Testament. It's just who God is. And he shows the permanency of it by calling it a statute and an ordinance. And of course, it is, is associated with redemption because it's a type of Christ. That tree is a symbol of Calvary. 
And when we apply Calvary to the bitter waters of life, they are made sweet. And friend, healing is included in the redemption of Christ. So this first prayer in the wilderness was basically Moses cried out, God, help. Exodus 17. This is a short time later and a short journey later. Verse 2, Exodus 17. Therefore the people contend with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you, there before you on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, this is after all of the miracles in Egypt. This is after the waters of the Red Sea had parted. This is after the, the miracle of turning the bitter water sweet actually just a few days later. And once again, the Israelites are tempting the Lord and they are complaining. And their sin was not in their asking. Their sin was in their attitude. It wasn't that they asked for water, but it was how they asked for it. And again, Moses' prayer was very brief. Lord, what do I do with the people? They want to kill me. That was it. And God showed Moses what to do. Now, I want you to notice, Moses does not suggest to God how he might fix the problem. He left that to God. You see, the trouble with dictating to God how he's supposed to do things is that according to Ephesians 1.11, that Lord, the Lord only works things after the counsel of his own will, not after our will, not after our strategy. And also, if we try and dictate the how to God, it limits our ability to perceive him working. If we say, okay, God, this is what's going on, and you just need to be, bring me this answer out of the north, that makes sense, that's what I'm expecting. What are you going to do if he brings the answer from the south, or the east, or the west, or from below, or from above? I think sometimes we actually miss the answers that God brings, because we've kind of painted God in a box, and we expect him only to do things in a certain way. I remember I had a friend, this is when I was in Bible school, and she said, Bayless, will you pray with me? I said, yeah, what's up? She said, man, I've got this, this financial need, I've got these bills that are due, and I don't have the funds, would you agree with me in prayer? So I said, yeah, and I remember taking her hands and praying that God would meet her need. Prayed a fervent prayer. I believed when I prayed. She went away, and a few minutes later, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, good prayer. You know you have the money to answer that prayer you just prayed. I thought, well, Lord, actually, yes, I do. Would you like me to do that? I, said, I, I felt in my heart. He said, yes. So I went over. This is probably half hour after we prayed. I said, hey, I got something for you. Hand her an envelope. She opens it up. There's all the money that she needs to cover her bills. She says, I can't take that. I said, why? She said, because you knew. She said, I'm trusting God. This doesn't count. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. It's true. This is the conversation. I said, wait a minute. You're telling me that God is only allowed to answer your prayer through someone that doesn't know about your need? She said, yes. I said, you can't put God in a box. Take the money. I, I think we do that so many times. And God delights in overturning the apple cart, as it were, and bringing things about in a different way. I remember I was in a, a meeting once and listening to a, a guy share a story, and it impacted me. Talked about a meeting that was being held in Asia. 
And they'd never had a gospel meeting of this sort there. And they advertised it big time. And they actually brought over a number of the most prominent ministers in the United States over. One individual in particular that had a big miracle ministry. Somebody else is like a top-notch Bible teacher known in the United States. And so this big meeting is packed. They've advertised it all. You've got all the famous people sitting there. And so the, the, the person with a miracle ministry, genuine ministry, gets out there, and it's like every word they spoke just fell off the end of the pulpit, never made it to the front row. And people in the audience began to heckle this person and actually throw things on the platform. They were, the, the majority of the people that were attending that came because of the advertising were unsaved. And they were laughing and throwing things, and the person ended up leaving the platform in shame. And it turns out that was the last message they ever preached before they died. And so one of the other famous guys, famous Bible teacher, tries to salvage the meeting, and he gets up. And, and according to the guy that was sharing the story with me and some others, he said he pulled some old canned, very tired sermon, you know, out of the closet, dusted it off, and proceeded to preach this mini-sermon, and he said it was like a bunch of dry bones in the middle of the desert. Said just nothing. The people jeered that they were making fun. They were still throwing stuff. It was a disaster. So they said they're going to close the meeting. They invited a little African couple to come up and pray and close the meeting. He said this little stout African woman gets up, looks at the crowd, crosses her arms, and starts to pray in the Spirit. And her husband is handed the microphone, but instead of praying a closing prayer, he just said, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. And here's his wife, got her arms crossed, and she's praying in the Spirit, <laughs> praying in the Spirit. He says it again, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. She's over here just praying, praying in the Spirit, glaring at everybody. He says it a third time, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Suddenly somebody cries out from the audience. And then a person comes running up the front, throws a pack of cigarettes up on the platform, gets on their knees and starts to cry. The little woman's still praying, praying in the Spirit, just praying. He says it again, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. People began to stream out of their seats, come up to the front, throw drugs up on the altar, cry out to God until the entire front of that large building was filled with people crying out to God for mercy and getting saved. How did God do it? through a little stout African woman that was praying in the Spirit and her husband. The entirety of the sermon, beginning and end, was let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Friend, you just can't put God in a box. It wasn't the scholarly Bible teacher. It wasn't the miracle worker. It was the unknown couple that God used to bring the Holy Spirit into that meeting and bring revival. And for some of you, just quit telling God how to do his job. <laughs> Moses didn't even suggest to God how to fix this problem. He let God work that out. All right, Exodus chapter 32. Look with me if you would. And verse 7, Exodus 32 and 7, we come to another instance not too much longer after that which we just read, verse 7, Exodus 32, 7. And the Lord said to Moses, go, get down. Now, he's up on the mountain. He's just received the Ten Commandments, okay? That's the, the setting. God says, go, get down. For your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Now, that is an interesting thing. God's just given the Ten Commandments to Moses. You better get down. Your people, you brought out of Egypt, they've corrupted themselves. Moses, get busy. And so we read on, verse 8, they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They've made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation. In other words, Moses, let's start over. I'm going to scratch everyone out, and I'm going to build a brand new nation just out of you. And look what Moses says. Verse 11, Then Moses pleaded with the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, 
who you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Now, God, you've got this thing backwards. They're not my people. I didn't bring them out of Egypt. They're your people, and you brought them out of Egypt. Moses sort of flips the script here. Verse 14, so the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Now, here we have a picture of Moses, the intercessor, standing between the people and destruction. That's what an intercessor is. They stand between. And realizing the gravity of the people's sin, Moses actually addresses God again shortly after this. The same chapter in verse 30. Now it came to pass on the next day, Moses said to the people, you've committed a great sin, so now I will go to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for you or for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now just take a look at the heart of Moses in prayer. He's trying to stand in a place that, that he's not qualified to stand in. He's saying, God, I'll be their substitute. Don't blot them out of your book. Blot me out of your book instead. I'll take their place. But he had such a heart for the people. You know, according to Second, or 1 Timothy 2 and 1, one of the types of prayers that we're to be praying as believers are prayers of intercession, where we pray for others, where we stand in the gap for others. You know, in Luke chapter 13, a bunch of people came to Jesus and they said, hey, did you hear about all of the Galileans that Pontius Pilate killed them during worship? He murdered them and mixed their blood with the blood of the sacrifices. And Jesus said, you think those Galileans were bigger sinners than any other Galileans? Let me tell you, unless you repent, you'll perish likewise. Jesus went on. He says, did you hear about how the Tower of Siloam fell, fell on 18 people and killed them? He says, you think they were bigger sinners than anyone else in Jerusalem? He said, no. But I tell you, unless you repent, you'll likewise perish. And then right after that, Jesus tells this parable that's vitally connected to the two incidents he just mentioned. He said, you know, there was a little fig tree planted in a vineyard. So a fig tree surrounded by grapevines says, and for three years, the master of the vineyard came to that little fig tree looking for fruit, didn't find any. After three years, he said, cut the thing down. It's just using up the ground. He said, but somebody came and said, wait. Give it another year. I'll dig around it. I'll fertilize it. And then if it doesn't bear fruit, then you can cut it down. What happened? Destruction was headed to that tree until an intercessor stepped in. Someone because they stood in between, gave it more time. And Jesus' point was, you know why those Galileans died? Not because they were worse than anybody else. It wasn't the judgment of God. It's because there was no intercessor. You know why the tower fell on those people? It's not because they were big sinners. It's because there was no intercessor. There was no one to stand in the gap. You know, in Acts chapter 12, it said that King Herod, he took James, the brother of John, and killed him with the edge of the sword. And he saw that it pleased the Jews. That's one of the 12 apostles. He's been murdered. He saw it pleased the Jews, so he sees Peter as well, intending to execute Peter just the same. But Peter had a miraculous deliverance. James was killed. Peter was delivered. You read in Acts chapter 12, the only difference between the two, continual prayer was made for Peter and if they prayed even one prayer for James, we're not told about it. The only difference was somebody stood in the gap. The only difference was intercession. I think maybe they thought, hey, James is larger than life. He's one of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Certainly nothing could happen to him. My friend, we need to pray for our leaders. Everyone needs prayer. Moses teaches us by being an intercessor. It is so so important. 
Now, we come to Exodus chapter 33, and by this time, God's pretty hacked off at the people. And so at the start of the chapter, God says, look, you're going to go in, you're going to inherit the promised land, but I'm not going. I'm going to send an angel instead. And the angel will go before you. You'll drive out the Jebusites, the Parasites, and the Hivites, and all the inhabitants of the land. And we pick it up in verse 12 of Exodus 33. It says, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know who you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I might find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then he, that is Moses, said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For now, then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight or how will it be known except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Now again, Moses making intercession for the people. God said, I'm not going, I'm sending an angel. Moses, wait a minute. If you don't go with us, cancel my reservations to the promised land. Um, the only thing that makes us difference, different than any other people on the whole earth is your presence. God says, okay, my presence will go with you. I'll do what you ask. And you know, the only thing that makes you different than anyone else in the world is the presence of God. That's the one thing that sets us apart as believers from the rest of the world. You know, my dad went to heaven in November. Doctor was in the room. My sister was there. Dad's breath was pretty labored. The doctor put his hand on my dad's chest, and my dad expelled his last breath on planet Earth, and he was gone. The doctor turned around to my sister and said, he was a believer, wasn't he? She said, yeah. He said, I feel the presence of God. And the doctor went out in the hallway and began to weep. The one thing that makes us different, my friend, is the presence of God. And some of you don't know it. You don't realize it. But people at your work, they're watching you. And they haven't put their finger on it, but they think, man, something's different about her. I don't know what it is. And it's not the eight-pound Bible that you bring to work either. <laughs> Some of you are being watched, you're being scrutinized very closely, and you don't know it, and people are thinking, what is it about him? What is it about her? They're different, and I don't know why. Some why somehow I'm attracted to what this person has. My friend, it's the presence of God. And Moses knew that. He said, God, angel, great, but if you just send an angel, I'm not going. If you're present, doesn't go with us, don't send us up there. Moses was a real intercessor. And then next we find a very personal prayer request by Moses. No doubt he was thinking about how God's presence makes us different, makes us different. And he says this in verse 18 in the same chapter. And he said, please show me your glory. Then he, that is the Lord, said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And Moses said, show me your glory. The Hebrew word translated glory in our English Bible literally means weight, mass, or substance. When Moses said, God, show me your glory, he was saying, God, I want to know who you are. I don't want to just know what you do, but I want to know why you do what you do. And it's interesting. The one attribute that God says when Moses said, God, 
Show me who you are. Your weight, your mass, your substance. Who are you on the inside? Who is this God that's brought us out of Egypt? God said, all my goodness will pass before you. And I will be gracious and I will be compassionate. Because the Lord is nothing so much as he is good. And he is merciful. And he is compassionate. And he is love. God said, you want to see? I'm going to show you my goodness because that's who and that is what I am on the inside. It was a request for personal, intimate knowledge of God. You know, years ago, our daughter Rebecca was traveling across Europe with a friend of hers. And they were going through Switzerland and they ended up high in the Swiss Alps and stayed in a little hostel that they just randomly found high in the Swiss Alps. And she's there, there's sort of like a community dining room, and the, the little gal that, that ran the hostel, I say little gal, she was an older woman, has got the television on, and she's watching answers. She's watching a broadcast from Cottonwood Church. And Rebecca says, do you, you know that guy? And the woman says, oh, he's great. I actually traveled a long way to listen to him preach. I've heard him preach before. Rebecca said, that's my dad freaked the woman out. <laughs> now, that woman may have known a little bit about me, even heard me personally preach, maybe picked up on some of my bizarre mannerisms. People tell me that I put my hands in my pockets a lot when I speak and a few other things. But you know, that woman knew me, but Rebecca knows me. I'm her daddy. She knows me intimately. She's seen me at my best. She's seen me at my worst. She knows what makes me happy. She knows what makes me sad. She can tell if something's going on with me. She walks in the room and says, what is it? That's what Moses is saying. God, I want to know you. Now, I think God, show me your glory is a great prayer to pray because not many people pray it. You will find yourself in a very select company if you begin to pray those kind of prayers. Because the majority of people's prayers, unlike Moses, is not for others. It's about their own personal needs. And Moses even went beyond being an intercessor, which is fantastic. But he went a step beyond that to God. I don't want anything from you, for myself or for anybody else. I just want to know you. I think we can get just as close to God as we desire. All right, look with me in the book of Numbers. Got a little more ground to cover. Numbers chapter 11. Numbers 11 and verse 4. It says, Now the mixed multitude, that is those that came out of Egypt with the Israelites, the mixed multitude, Numbers 11, 4, who were among them, yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up, and there is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. All we have to eat is angel's food. Friend, when manna no longer satisfies you, you've got a real problem. And it said that they yielded to in intense craving. That literally means uncontrolled, ravenous lust. So here's the people complaining again. Oh, back in Egypt, we had garlic and onions. Now we have to eat angels' food. Does Moses go into intercession for them once again? Does he say, God, blot me out of your book? Well, let's, let's see. Verse 10. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, officers over them, and bring them to the tabernacle of meeting. 
that they may stand there with you. Yeah. Reading the wrong verse. Let me just tell you what happened. I think I wrote the, wrote the wrong verse in my notes. Here's what happened. God gets mad, and Moses gets mad. Moses said, look, did I bring this people to birth? I can't carry them anymore. God, if you're going to treat me this way, just kill me. That's what Moses prayed. And I actually love the prayer because it's honest. Moses is overwhelmed. He said, I can't carry them. You know, what, what is this, some nursing child I'm supposed to carry around? God, I'm done with them. And if it's going to continue on, just take me home. I'm through. I'm through. I'm through. You know, King David said in Psalm 142, he said, I poured out my complaint before the Lord. And then God gave him an answer. God loves an honest heart. When your heart's overwhelmed, talk to God about it. And so God actually tells Moses to gather the 70, Ezra, the, the 70 elders, you know, and gives him an answer and put some of his spirit upon them. And then God sends a wind to bring quail into the camp of the Israelites. So many quail that it takes two days and one night of constant work without cessation to gather all of the quail that God had brought to them. But the Bible says, and you actually need to read this in tandem with Psalm 78 because the story's told there as well. Even though God miraculously supplies, their lust is not abated. And judgment came, and the guilty parties die, and they're buried. And Moses names the place the graves of lust. Not just because the instigators were buried there, but he was hoping to bury this problem of lust among God's people once and for all. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. For the problem continued to crop up as they traveled on. And let's look. Here's another problem came right away. Numbers 12. How many appreciate Moses a little more tonight? Oh, man. And we're not done. <laughs> 12 and verse 1. Now Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he'd married. For he'd married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not also spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Everybody say, uh-oh. Wow. Now, whether this was racially motivated because he married an Ethiopian woman or culturally motivated or just plain jealousy because they said, well, hey, Moses isn't the only one that God uses. God speaks through us as well. The Lord calls all three of them out. He says, why weren't you afraid to talk to my servant Moses? I speak to him face to face like no one else. And the Bible says God's presence lifted. And they looked, and Miriam, who apparently she was the eldest of the three, apparently she was the one that had uh, orchestrated the thing between her and her brother. Miriam became leprous. Friend, listen, you don't want God's presence to lift from you. You're in the danger zone when that happens. You don't want God's protecting hand to lift from you. And so there's Miriam. She's leprous, white as snow, and Moses prays a prayer of healing. Are you ready? Verse 13, it says, So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Please heal her, O God, I pray. Seven words. Please heal her, O God, I pray. This is what Moses didn't do. Lord, you know Miriam really has a good heart, and Lord, when I was a baby in the bulrushes, uh, she was the one that went and spoke to Pharaoh's daughter. And, and, and Lord, she's been a good sister. And you know that she means well. And, and when we crossed the Red Sea, Lord, she led the women in, in, in singing the songs and playing the tambourines. And Lord, you know, she really does have a gift on her life. And I don't really think that she, she knew what she was doing here. And, and, and Lord, she and my brother Aaron, they've always gotten along well. No, please Heal her, O oh God, I pray. Short, hot prayer. 
I pray with someone, and I know everyone's different. But if you're one of those, oh, God, you know, Miriam was a little girl. I remember we used to swing on the swing sets together. And, and God, I remember when we were in third grade, Lord, and she prayed this prayer. and she, You lose me at about 45 seconds, and I try and hang in there. Heal her, oh, God, I pray, period. And the Lord healed her. Now, Some people feel like they've been cheated if they get a heal her, oh God, I pray prayer. I had a friend in need of healing. He actually traveled a very long distance to be in, in the meeting of a healing evangelist, a guy that really had the gifts of healing operating in his life. And, you know, I think in the prayer line or, you know, whatever stage it was in the meeting, this is all he got was a declaration. Hands were laid on him. says, be healed in Jesus' name. I think it's five words. Be healed in Jesus' name. Yeah, five. And I talked to him later. He was so mad. He said, Bayless, I drove like two hours to get to this meeting, and I get a five-word declaration, and he moves on to the next person in line. He was still offended when he was talking to me. Now, I can guarantee you he went away without his needs being met. Can you say this with me? Heal her, oh God, I pray. Can we do that? Heal her, oh God, I pray. Pretty simple, huh? It doesn't have to be elaborate. You don't have to tell God a whole bunch of stuff he already knows. Now, be yourself. Some people, that's just you. But some people, they think they'll be heard for their much speaking, and that does not impress God. All right, a couple more things. We won't, well, in fact, look there, Numbers 14. I told you we're going to cover a lot of ground, but I'm going to go till I'm done. So, Numbers 14. They send the 12 spies into the promised land. They go in, it's everything God said. It's flowing with milk and honey. They bring back some of the fruit of the land. But 10 of the spies say, look, we can't do it. We know God says we can. And God says, every place the sole of your feet treads, I've given it to you, but it doesn't matter what God says, we can't do it. There's giants in there. There's walled cities. We can't. Eh. God's wrong. Except for two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb said, guys, shut up. We can't. That they're bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. The Lord is with us. Don't, don't be afraid. But all of Israel sides with the ten spies. And the whole nation goes at it again. Oh, would to God we died in the land of Egypt. Would to God we died in the wilderness. You brought us out here to kill us. And so they vote to get rid of Moses, choose a new leader, and march back to Egypt and offer themselves for slavery to the Egyptians once again. Well, there's a lot of things we could pull out of the story, but there's one that I want you to see. And I want you to look with me at verse 20, if you would, of chapter 14. Moses is talking with the Lord. I mean, talking with the Lord. Again, he acts as intercessor, stands in between. Verse 20, then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. All right, Moses, I forgive them. But, everyone say but. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. Everybody say ten times. Ten times. They did this over and over and over and over and over. Verse 23 they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. Verse 28. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who are numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. The ones that were 20 and less, God didn't hold accountable. But the other ones, 
They got exactly what they said. Now, why don't you listen to me? Look up here. This is, this is worth your whole price of the ticket getting in here tonight. Moses interceded on their behalf. And God said, okay, I forgive them. But they're still going to get just what they said. The things that they've been saying as a habit of life, that is what they'll partake of. They said again, wouldn't it God we died in the wilderness? Wouldn't it God we died in Egypt? You brought us out here to kill us. We're going to die. Oh, we're going to die. Wouldn't it God we're all dead? We're going to die of thirst. We're going to die of hunger. You just brought us out here to kill us, didn't you? We're going to die. We're going to die. We're going to die. They said it is a habit of life. And listen, no amount of intercession would change them eating the fruit of their own words, the thing they speak as a habit of life. And friends, someone can stand in the gap, Moses himself, and pray for you, and you can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus, cleansed and ready for heaven, but you will still reap what you sow. The things that you say as a habit of life, they will form your personal world that you live in. You better think about it. It is so true. Moses prayed, God forgave, but God said they're still going to get what they've said, not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, not five times. They've refused to hear my voice. They wouldn't listen to my word over and over and over. They have spoken contrary to my word, so they're going to get exactly what they have spoken. Now, the only two that got into the promised land were Joshua and Caleb. So Israel wanders in the wilderness doing laps around Mount Sinai for 40 years. Till all of those 20 years and older die. And then Joshua and Caleb lead the next generation into the promised land. They're the only two whose heart and lips agreed with God's word. They saw the same giants. They saw the same walled cities. They saw everything the other 10 spies saw. But they said, you know what God says is right, even if it doesn't make sense to us. Even if our, our vision tells us something else, even if the majority report is different, we are going to say what God says. And they're the only ones that experience in their life the promise of God. So intercession, as beautiful as it is, no amount of it is going to change you partaking of the things that you speak as a habit of life. You will get what comes out of your heart and your mouth. You say it over and over. You will eat the fruit of it. All right, let me tell you about the next one, and then I'm going to end with one. You can read this later in Numbers chapter 21, the beginning of the chapter. It's an amazing story. The Israelites are at it again. They Now they have to travel around the land of Edom because the Edomites said you can't come through our property. So their arrival time to the promised land has been delayed, and they begin to grumble and complain. Since you brought us out here to kill us. It would have been better for us to die in Egypt. It would have been better for us to, I mean, they're doing it again. Same thing. They haven't learned yet. Would have been better if we would have just died out here. And then suddenly serpents came in and began to bite the people. Many of the Israelites died. And they came to Moses. Moses, we, we've sinned. We did it again. We sinned against God. We sinned against you. We've spoken against God, against you. Please ask the Lord to get rid of the serpents. So Moses goes, intercessor. God says, okay, Moses, this is what you do. Make a serpent of brown, bronze, put it on a pole. It'll come to pass everyone that sees it. And the Hebrew says, everyone that looks at it with a steady and absorbing gaze, they'll live. And he did. Makes this, this bronze serpent, puts it on the pole. Everyone that looks at it, they're healed and they live. They didn't die of their snake bites. And of course, it's a type of Christ because Jesus said in John, I believe it's chapter three, verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. It was a type of Christ. Now you think about it. How can a serpent on a pole be a type of Christ on the cross? How can, how can a serpent be a type of Christ? A serpent represents the enemy. A serpent represents the work of the enemy. In fact, you remember in, in Pharaoh's court, Moses threw his rod down. What happened to his rod? Turned into a serpent, didn't it? Pharaoh's magicians, they threw their rods down. What happened to their rods? They turned into serpents. But what did Moses' rod that had turned into a serpent do to all their rods turned into a serpent? 
it ate up all their serpents. Well, you know, there's a prophecy in Isaiah 11 and 1 speaking about Jesus as a rod will come out of Jesse. And my friend, on Calvary's tree, Jesus so identified with the curse, he swallowed up everything that the devil had thrown at the human race. He swallowed up sickness. He swallowed up grief. He swallowed up brokenheartedness. He swallowed up sin. He swallowed up everything that has gone wrong with humanity. He took it all into himself and died. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. Cursed is anyone that hangs on a tree so that we might go free. And anyone that beholds God's sacrifice on Calvary's tree, not just some quick glance, but with a steady and absorbing gaze and realizes what Christ has done for them, they can live. They can have eternal life. One final prayer. You ready for it? This prayer, God did not answer. This is the one prayer of Moses that God refused to answer. Now, we've seen the type of Calvary when the tree was thrown into the bitter waters and they turned sweet. The serpent on the pole, a type of Calvary and Christ becoming a curse for us. But there was also another type of Christ that we read about in Moses' life. It's when the people were thirsting and God said, bring the elders, take your rod, hit the rock, and waters will come out. The New Testament tells us in particular in 1 Corinthians 10 and 4 that that rock was Christ. It's a type of Jesus Christ. We come to Numbers 20 and again, the people are complaining and they're accusing. Would to God we die? There's nothing to drink out here. There's nothing to eat out here. Why would you bring us out here, Moses? I mean, this, this was non-stop during the entire wilderness journey. Moses falls on his face to pray. And it's worth us to read these verses. Chapter 20 and verse 7. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the rod. You and your brother Aaron, together with the congregation, speak to the rock before their eyes. Everyone say, speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. And it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. Water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me, nor hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I've given them. Seems pretty harsh, huh? Moses, you're not getting into the promised land. I know you've put up with a lot, but because you didn't do what I say, you're not getting in. One last place, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 3, Moses is relating to the people what went on, and he tells them about a prayer he prayed to the Lord at this time. Deuteronomy 3. Verse 23, then I pleaded with the Lord at that time saying, O Lord God, you've begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains in Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south, the east, and behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. Why? Why so harsh? 
This was Moses that stood in the gap and said, God, blot me out of your book. Forgive them. Again and again and again. He stood for the people and said, God, have mercy on them, please. The reason God was so harsh is because this was a type of Christ. Moses in his anger ruined the type and shadow. Previously, he had hit the rock once, and out came the living waters, and now God says, you just need to speak to the rock, and the waters will come out. But Moses, in his anger, took his rod, and he hit the rock several more times. Friend, Jesus only needed to be smitten once upon Calvary's tree. And then from that point on, anyone that speaks to him and confesses him as Lord, outflow rivers of living water and change people's lives. He didn't need to be smitten again and again. It was one sacrifice for all time, paid for all the sins of all of mankind in every generation. There is no more sacrifice. Jesus is it. He died once for all. And it was so serious. God is looking at the multiplied billions of people hanging in the balance and realizing the importance of this type and shadow. Moses, there's eternal souls hanging in the balance, people that will spend an eternity with me or separated from me. And you ruin that which points to my son, the one and only way of salvation. So no Moses, you won't get in. You understand it when you think of the gravity from God's point of view. Just now, if you wouldn't mind, close your eyes, bow your head just for a moment. Have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Have you accepted God's one and only sacrifice? The one who when his work on Calvary is applied to our lives, it turns the bitter waters of life sweet. The one who became a curse that we might know the blessing of God in our life. The one who knew no sin but was made to be sin for us that we might be made right with God. The one that was smitten. The righteous and the holy and the innocent one that was judged for our sin because of his sacrifice, now freely, rivers of living water pour out to anyone that will drink. Doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, how far you've strayed, my friend, God loves you. And it's time for you to come home. I want you to right now, every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. If you'll get serious with God and say these words to him, God will meet you, my friend. Just take a moment. Pray with me. Say it out loud. So, God, I come to you. I believe your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for me. And he took away my sin. And he offers me his righteousness. Jesus, you didn't have to do it, but you did. And I am so thankful. I accept your grace, your goodness, and your mercy. Wash me clean. Give me a new life, I pray. I put my trust in you, Jesus. I believe you have been raised from the dead. And from this moment onward, my life is yours. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Awesome.